Hello and welcome to our 27th session on our Scottish Wars of Independence course. This episode we'll look at the year 1307 and the fall of a king. Our aim today is to learn how Bruce tried to rebuild his power in Scotland in 1307. By the end of the session you should be able to describe Bruce's actions to rebuild his power base in mainland Scotland. We should also be able to explain why Bruce was more successful in battle in 1307 as compared to the disaster of 1306 and be able to assess the most important events in 1307 for Bruce's attempts to re-establish his sovereign power. Let's begin with a recap of where we left off last time. The ambitions of the Bruce in 1306. 1306 was the year that Bruce finally launched his bid to become the King of Scotland. The greatest obstacle in his way was the Red Common. The Bruce family and the Common family were the two most powerful noble factions within Scotland at this time. And the Commons, if anything, were actually more important and more powerful than the Bruce's. If Bruce was to realise his dream to become the King of Scotland, the Common would have to be dealt with or forced to step aside. Bruce had courted Common for some months before their meeting in 1306, which had resulted in Common betraying Bruce's ambitions to Edward and Bruce having to flee the English Parliament. The two arranged a secret meeting in Greyfriars Kirk, while elsewhere in Dumfries the Scottish Parliament was meeting to discuss the business of the land. The meeting went not well between the two men. Bruce walked out, but Common didn't. And committing the crime of sacrilege in the church is enormous. Bruce was excommunicated by the Pope and declared an outlaw. By March, Bruce had been given absolution by the Scottish Church. Bishop Wisher had given him his forgiveness and arranged his coronation in a hasty ceremony. Bruce was now the King of Scotland, in name at least. The ceremony itself shows the impromptu state of affairs that Bruce found himself in. A third of the Scottish nobility showed the rest did not. Only a handful of bishops showed up to offer the support of the church. The royal regalia had to be made from his own jewellery and his own uh, wealth that he had. The crown had been taken by Edward. The symbols of the Scottish uh, sovereignty are also gone. The stone of destiny now rested underneath Edward's throne down in London. Bruce's own wife commented at his coronation that he was playing at being king. From March through to May, Bruce worked to establish his authority across North East Scotland. Working with Bishop Wishart, his armies flooded through Fife, across Perthshire, Angus and up towards Aberdeen. The nobles of that part of the kingdom were not keen to bend the knee to Bruce and had to be forced. Some of them were even threatened with being hung if they did not swear allegiance to their new king. Bruce needed this part of Scotland because it was perhaps one of the wealthiest uh, areas of farming land that we had. On top of that, holding the port of Aberdeen gave him access to the ports of Northern Europe where he could establish trade and bring in mercenaries and weapons to support what would be his resistance effort against Edward once the English king had been able to respond. By June, the English response came. Aymer de Valance was appointed uh, by Edward as John Common's brother-in-law to lead an English army across the border. This army wasn't as big as the forces we saw before the Battle of Stonebridge or the Battles of Falkirk. This was a 3,000 man force sent with speed to deal with this upstart rebel. Valance managed to ambush Bruce in Methven Woods, just outside Perth, and attack him while he was encamped uh, during the night. Bruce lost most of his infantry in the attack, and his cavalry were then beaten again a few days later near Loch Tay. Bruce fled west in disarray. The straggling remains of his army were defeated again after they were ambushed by the MacDougall clan at the Pass of Brander by Loch Awside, and Bruce is said to have escaped with fewer than 200 men. Those who did fled down the Kintyre Peninsula, hiding out at Dunaverty Castle, which is just south of Campbelltown, where the pursuing English army holed his forces up and laid siege to the castle. When they eventually got in, though, they found that Bruce had gone. He managed to take ship and disappear off into the Western Isles. And we don't know exactly where he spent that winter, other than that he was in hiding. So by the end of 1306, Bruce's great ambitions to achieve his life goal, to take the crown of Scotland, had ended in failure and tragedy for him and his family. 
Whilst he had experienced military defeat, it's important to remember as well that the English had managed to take the women folk of his family. His wife had been taken, his queen, and also his daughter. His brother Neil, who'd been guarding them at Kildrummy Castle, had been executed by the English. So, 1307 would bring Robert the Bruce's return as he went for one last throw of the dice. Now remember, as we go through these uh, videos, to build up our notes as we work our way through the course, um, you should be taking down uh, a note of anything that appears here in bold to build up your chronology of events as they come. If it's in bold, please do record it in your notes. If it's not in bold, it's okay, it's just context to build up an understanding of the wider events that are happening at the time. So Bruce returned to mainland Scotland in February 1307 in order to reclaim his kingdom. His forces arrived in two groups. The first landed on the shores of his own earldom of Carrick, which is down in southwest Scotland, led by Robert and his youngest brother Edward. They recaptured Turnbury Castle and they raised a small army from amongst his tenants. Now a picture of Turnbury Castle will appear here. This ruin is what is left of Turnbury now. This reconstruction by historian Andrew Spratt shows what the castle would have been like. It looks phenomenal. Look at that. Basically a garage for his own warship to sail into, which you can still see in the remains of the castle um, if you were to go and visit it today. Now Bruce really did get involved in a tooth and nail battle with the English to take control of his kingdom and there were no prisoners taken, least of which would have been his own lands and possessions. To deny the English his castle in later phases of the war, Bruce and his men took it and destroyed it in 1310 to prevent it falling into the hands of the English. It was never again rebuilt. So the room we see here is done by Scottish hands to prevent the English from taking it. It's not done by English invaders. The second group to land on the shores of the mainland were led by Robert's other surviving brothers, Thomas and Alexander, who landed slightly further south in Loch Ryan near Stranraer. And that's not far from where the Northern Ireland ferry now leaves. Their army consisted of a thousand soldiers and 18 war galleys. And this group was quickly overwhelmed and defeated by local forces led by a man with an amazing name of Dungal MacDougall, who was loyal to the Balliols and Edward. Now this was a disaster for the Bruces. The Battle of Stranra was fought on the 9th to the 10th of February in 1307. Only two of those war galleys escaped from the disaster. Thomas and Alexander were captured. They were sent to Carlisle, where they were executed. Three of Bruce's brothers have now been killed in the space of a year. Glentrul. Undeterred, incredibly, by the loss of yet more family members, Bruce resolved to set up his camp in Glen True, which is a narrow glen in the uplands of Dumfries and Galloway. Now Bruce realised he could no longer afford to fight like a king or a knight. He would instead now use the tactics of guerrilla warfare. In previous years, Wallace had used this method of fighting against the English with notable success. Bruce's first success came with a raid on an English army camp on the eastern shores of Clashring Shaws Loch, 15 miles east of his base. The attack alerted Aimer de Valance and the main English army hunting Bruce. In April 1307, Valance marched his forces to Glentrue to chase down his prey. He was intent on exterminating the Bruce threat once and for all. This is Glentrue today. Bruce's base of Glentru was a narrow valley, holding a small loch that was closely hemmed in by steep hillsides. It was a difficult position to approach, and as the loch takes up much of the glen, there isn't much space for men. There's only one narrow track through it, bordered by a steep slope. Now in the picture here, you can see on the opposite bank of the loch, the kind of spidery lines of that track winding its way up the hillside. This is the track the English army would have to use to get to Bruce and his men. Bruce made effective use of the terrain before the English arrived. So during the preceding night, Bruce had sent men up the slope with orders to use levers and crowbars to loosen as many of the detached blocks of granite as they could. As the English vanguard, the foremost men in the army, approached up the narrowest point of the track, 
near the middle of the glen at a place called the Steps of Truel, they were forced to march single file. Now, on the photograph here at the back of the, the image, you can see the Steps of Truel is where that path kind of winds its way up the hillside. So you can imagine on that rocky outcrop above, Bruce's soldiers hiding behind the rocks, bars, crowbars, stave staffs in hand, ready to shoulder down the boulders and half the hillside onto the men um, crawling along unwitting below. Bruce observed their progress from across the loch, and at a given signal, his men pushed the wall of boulders down the slope. This is proper Hollywood stuff. This was followed by arrows and hand-to-hand -hand combat as Bruce's men charged down the slope. The narrowness of the path prevented Valance from supporting his men from either the front or the rear. Without room to manoeuvre, many of the English below the ambush were killed and the rest withdrew in panic. Bruce's new guerrilla tactics had proven successful and for the first time he had fought the English and he had won. You can imagine psychologically the impact of this on Bruce and his men must have been enormous. It seems possibly for the first time for them, the scales have been turned. Possibly Bruce and his men could make something of this. They could do something here. The first taste of success. Loudon Hill is where they would test this theory. Now Bruce continued northwards with his small army into Ayrshire, once again coming face to face with Valance at Loudon Hill on the 10th of May 1307. News of his victory at Glentrue had attracted more followers, swelling Bruce's army to around 600 men. Now bear in mind, Valance's army is around about 3,000 at this stage, so Bruce's army is tiny compared to the opposition. The defeat he'd inflicted upon Valance at Glentrue was by no means massive. We're talking that Valance probably left behind maybe maximum a hundred dead. He only managed to sting part of the English force before the rest ran away. It's a psychological victory more than it is a victory of numbers for Bruce. However, that is still important. And as we can see, it's one of extra support. So there we are. Valance's pursuing army numbered around 3,000. Bruce would be outnumbered at five to one as he sets out his fence for this battle. Now this is the battlefield today, Loudon Hill in the background. There's a statue there uh, that's been erected to commemorate the events. In Methenwood, Bruce had learned his lesson not to fight a larger army on even terms. At Loudon Hill, he chose a battlefield where he could use his intimate knowledge of the Scottish landscape to his advantage. Bruce's army took up a position on a small plain about 500 metres across just south of Loudon Hill. Now, half a kilometre across is a lot of land for only 600 men to hold against 3,000. So you're going to find something else was going on here. Now Valence's only route of approach was along a narrow highway through a deep bog, which extended for the width of the plain on either side of the road. So here's the trick. Bruce knows, just like Wallace did at the Ballastell Bridge, that boggy, Heavy, wet land on either side of a narrow causeway or road is perfect for a smaller, determined force to match a superior, larger force equipped with cavalry. Those horses are going to be no use on that muddy terrain. So this is Bruce's real chance to pull off a Stellenbridge-esque win. So Bruce's men dug their ditches outwards from the bog, parallel to the road, and this stopped Valence's army from fanning out and using their numbers to encircle Bruce's men. So Bruce is basically channeling this much larger English force down this road, down this causeway through the bog towards his forces where they're going to go toe to toe. And they're not going to be surrounded. It's going to be too difficult to slow the English to make much progress around the flanks of the Scottish army. Now, historians such as Fouillon or Watson have suggested that Robert had taken inspiration for the ditch digging idea from Flemish or basically Belgian foot soldiers who'd gained an unlikely victory five years before at the Battle of Courtrai. She notes that basically the foot soldiers, merchants, craftsmen of the great Flemish cities of Bruges, Ghent and Ypres took on the French cavalry and they dug ditches and they used the terrain and they won an astounding victory. Now it's important to remember that in the medieval world people are not living in completely in isolation. They would hear about major events that are happening across Europe. 
trade through word of mouth or traders or even letters. So they're not living in complete isolation from everything else that's going on. So it is more than likely Bruce would have heard about the surprising victory of the Flemish at Coutray and he's having a go at seeing if he can pull off one here for himself. Now, the ditches were laid out in such a way that Valence was forced to attack only along the highway. He faced a narrow, constricted front, attacking up the flanks of the hill towards the waiting spears of Bruce's ranks. So not only is his much larger force being funnelled into this narrow roadway, he is fighting on a muddy road that's slippy underfoot, and he's fighting uphill into a wall of spears. This is a really negative situation for the English army to find themselves in. Now John Barber in his poem The Bruce wrote this, The king's men met them at the dike, so stoutly that the most warlike and strongest of them fell to the ground. Then could be heard a dreadful sound as spears on armour rudely shattered, and cries and groans the wounded uttered. For those that first engaged in fight, battled and fought with all their might, their shouts and cries rose loud and clear, a grievous noise it was to hear. Wow, stern stuff. So it was a battle which echoed the situation another superior English army had found themselves in at Stirling Bridge, with the same filtering effect at work. And the English were channeled across that bridge and into that loop, that meander um, of the river on that boggy ground. Bruce has managed to do it. He's done the trick. Now, struggling with the terrain, Valencia's charge did not go well. As Bruce's spearmen pressed downhill on them, on the disorganised English knights, they fought with such vigour that the rear ranks of Valencia's army began to flee in panic. A hundred or more English soldiers were killed in the battle for the loss of only a handful of Scots. Eamon de Valence managed to escape the carnage and he fled to the safety of Bothwell Castle near Hamilton. Three days after the Battle of Loudon Hill, Bruce defeated another English force in Ayrshire, this time under the Earl of Gloucester. He was on a roll. So from the ashes of 1306, Bruce rose up and he's now achieved three victories on the bounce. This is only going to build his prestige, build his reputation. People are going to start passing around word that Bruce is a winner and he's going to attract yet more soldiers to his banner. His power was starting to grow. Edward was not going to let this go unaddressed. His lieutenants in Scotland have failed to do the job, so Edward decided he would have to come himself. Alarmed by Bruce's return, Edward I decided to launch another invasion of Scotland, as he had successfully done the year before. He was determined to defeat Bruce, as he had defeated the Wallace. He led the main English army north, headed for Bruce's heartlands of Dumfries and Galloway. But at 68, Edward was old now, and his health was failing. He caught dysentery, which is basically terminal diarrhoea, and on the 7th of July 1307, the hammer of the Scots died at Borough on Sands, only a few miles from the Scottish border. Now this memorial, if you go to Borough on Sands on the south side of the Solway Firth today, you find this 19th century memorial that replaced a far older monument. Borough on Sands is basically just a flat, dried out marsh. At the time of the Scottish Wars of Independence, the easiest way for armies to get into Scotland on the west side of Britain uh, was not to follow the line of the M6 and M74 motorway uh, through Carlisle and straight north. No, uh, the best way actually was to come to Borough on Sands here. And as you move a little bit north from here to the shore of the Solway Firth, um, they would see the north side of the riverbank in Scotland a mile away. And yet the Solway Firth is a tidal river, and at that point it is so shallow, there's a sandbar that raises up, that if you stand at Baron Sands and you mark your location opposite a standing stone on the north bank called the Loch Maben Stone, you can apparently follow that sandbank and you can wade out at low tide, and way no deeper than knee height, you can wade out at low tide all the way across, one mile across the Solway Firth, and uh, ford it and make it up on the north bank. That's what armies used to do when they came to invade Scotland. They'd all come to the shore at Baron Sands and they'd wade across the river at low tide to enter Scotland at Loch Mabin. That's why there was a castle there, Loch Mabin. Um, Edward never made it across to Scotland that time. He died. Now, 
this was a disaster for the English. The great king, Edward I, was gone. Now this is a picture, interestingly, of Edward I's body when his tomb was opened in the 18th century. A sketch of the body was taken before they resealed him back in there. And it's fascinating to see there's still flesh on the bones and that the burial shrouds are still intact. Absolutely, absolutely amazing. There are traces of a Latin inscription on the outside of the sarcophagus and it reads, Edwardus primus scotorum malleus hic est 1308. Pactum Serva, which translates as, here's Edward I, Hammer of the Scots, 1308, keep the vow. Can still be seen painted on the side of his marble tomb in Westminster Abbey, referring to his vow to avenge the rebellion of Robert the Bruce. How about that for echoing down through the ages? The various accounts survive of Edward's last wishes from Borough on the Sands. The sources agree that Edward wanted his son to continue campaigning against the Bruce. Prince of Wales, also Edward, decided to take his father's body instead to Richmond to hand it over to the Archbishop of York before returning to the southwest of Scotland to campaign against Bruce's rebellion. This took some time for him to do. By that time, Bruce had marched into the far north of Scotland. No way he was going to fight a humongous English uh, army that had come to deal with him. He knew he'd learned his lesson, do not fight a larger army in the field guerrilla tactics were the way to go. So the Prince of Wales was in no mood to pursue him and instead returned to England in August 1307 to be crowned in London as Edward II. His decision gave Bruce a free hand to act in Scotland as he wished. His major enemy is gone. Now we finish off this session with today's big question. So based on the notes you've taken down from this video, I would like you to take a note of the question and come up with your answer. So in your opinion, what was the most important event in reinvigorating Bruce's campaign for the throne of Scotland in 1307? Explain your reasons why. What was the thing that made the biggest difference to Bruce turning things around? What, well, in your opinion, and explain why, is the reason for Bruce's success in the ashes of 1306. That's it for this session. Thanks very much and see you again soon.